So, so um, if you have questions and if you've already written them on a card, just hold them up, wave them around. Someone will come away around and grab them. I'm not sure how many we will be able to get to, but uh, grab somebody's attention. They'll bring them up here. I'm going to start because once you get started, I'll never get another word. Yeah, there's there's oh, okay. I don't know. I'm okay. I'll show okay. some discipline. All right. So I think a lot of Americans are still thinking in terms of sort of like the, the Apollo and shuttle model where there's, there's like a major space event like every nine months or something, you right. know? Yeah. And it's astonishing. I have an app on my phone called Next Space Flight and it tells you when the next launch is. And, and there's something going on. There's a couple things every week yeah. going on, you know, whether they're, whether they're satellite launches or tests or something like that. There's just so much going on. So we really are committed to putting astronauts in space on American equipment next year, aren't we? We are, 100%. It's just, it's just amazing to me. Now, is commercially so? Is now are, is NASA in the unique position of both overseeing, but also then competing because you've got SpaceX right with crew modules, right? Yeah. Then you've got you, you've got uh, the Artemis project and all these different projects. So what what is it what is it like to be sort of like competing, but then also facilitating private competitors at the same time? That's a that's a great question, and and so I get this question a lot about um, is is this a competition between them and NASA? Mm -hmm. And and the answer is absolutely not. Okay. Um, they exist because of NASA. And we have helped them along the way. In fact, they couldn't do it without the NASA engineers and the NASA scientists embedded and engaged without the partnership that has, that has been developed here. Um, we see them as a partner. We need them to be successful. If they're not successful, we're not going to be successful. Remember what the goal here is. The goal is for NASA, when it comes to low Earth orbit specifically, we want to be a customer. We want to we want to be one of many customers, and we want to have numerous providers that are competing on cost and innovation. And if we have that, then our costs go down. The American taxpayer can get a lot more bang for their dollar right. in in low Earth orbit. But then what NASA can do is we can use the resources to do what commercial industry isn't ready for yet, and that is go to the moon and onto Mars and develop everything that is necessary between the Earth and the moon, what we call cis lunar space. Um, so I think that's important. The other thing, I love what you just talked about, how all of these things that are happening all of the time, if I could just um, make reference to that really quickly. You know, it wasn't too long ago, China landed um, a, a lander on the far side of the moon. It was about the size of that podium over there. And I got called to the hill to explain how we fell behind. <laughs> <laughs> and. Um, to be clear, that was a great achievement. We, we landed, they landed on the far side of the moon. That's never been done before. Um, it requires a communications relay. That's what it requires. And we could have done it. We just haven't really had a, a mission to do it. Uh, what is interesting is uh, China then took a two-page two ad out in The Economist magazine, <laughs> and they've been promoting themselves around the world as the, basically the preeminent spacefaring agency, and everybody needs to partner with them mm. and not the United States mm. by, by definition. Um, and I think that we have to make sure that people understand that landing a robot or, not, or a lander on the far side of the moon is a little different. Than, so I go to the Hill, and they want to know how we fell behind, and I say, wait a second. Uh, we just landed on the far side as well of Mars. <laughs> And, and <laughs> and we did it for the eighth time in human history. <laughs> and by the way, when we landed on the far side of Mars, it was just a few weeks after that that we entered orbit around Bennu, an asteroid in deep space with a, a, a robot called Osiris Rex that for the first time in history is going to go down and take a, a piece of Bennu and bring it back to Earth for a, an asteroid return mission, mm. which has never been done before in human history. That's going to happen in 2021, so hold your breath. And then number two, um, we, we took, you remember the New Horizons probe that flew by Pluto in 2015? And to be clear, your NASA administrator believes Pluto is a planet. Yeah. Good, good. Yeah. good. Right. Good. That's in the Republican platform. Right, <laughs> right. we're going we're gonna to put it there. <laughs> yeah. Make Pluto a planet again. Oh, my, that's a great idea. MPP. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> okay, so, um, so <laughs> I'm, I'm distracted. Sorry, now. sorry about that. So <laughs> My job is done. Okay. Yeah. 
the, the, uh, the Pluto flyby, New Horizons, 2015, amazing accomplishment. That same probe, and by the way, a lot of that was done here in Texas at the Southwest, Re Southwest Research Institute, but that same probe goes way out into deep space into what we call the Kipper Belt, which is beyond Pluto with a bunch of asteroids out there, and it takes beautiful images of something called Ultima Thule, which is a, a binary contact asteroid where two asteroids have now come together and the, the small gravity between the two has somehow forced them into a position where it, it looks like a barbell. Mm -hmm. We get beautiful images, nobody could have guessed that, and now we have that image and we're getting great data and science back. Um, so we're learning so much about these planets and, and these, these celestial bodies way out even past Pluto. Um, and, and that happened just a few weeks after entering, or just a few days after entering um, orbit around Bennu. So we got OSIRIS-REx landing on the far side of Mars. We've got entering orbit around Bennu, which has never been done, an asteroid that small orbiting it with a, with a robot. And then we're flying by Ultima Thule in deep space. And then we have the, the SpaceX Crew Dragon docked to the International Space Station uh, using automatic rendezvous and docking. Um, and, and, and all the stories are, how did we fall so far behind? Yeah, yeah. Well, you it's know, frustrating. Yeah, you know one yeah, thing, one yeah. thing will fix that. One thing will fix that. More human footprints on the moon. So, 100%. because 50 years ago, generationally, I was 11 watching Neil and Buzz, and I thought, surely I would walk on the moon myself by the time I'm 40. That didn't happen. So anyway, to make right on that promise, let's talk about getting human footprints back on the moon maybe as soon as four years from now? 2024. And yes, we're on, we're on track to make that happen. Um, a couple of things that have to happen, have to happen. And I know there's staffers for members of Congress in the room and uh, maybe the dad of a senator in the room. Um, <laughs> so w what we have to do is we have to make sure that we are building, this is not a Republican or Democrat thing at all. Uh, we have strong bipartisan support for these activities. Um, and that's the tradition of NASA going back to the 1960s. Republicans supported the agenda under President Kennedy when it was first announced. Um, and we wanna make sure we keep this bipartisan support going. Uh, we have to make sure that we get the appropriations necessary to achieve it. It is not cheap to go to the moon and onto Mars. We cannot do it with the current enacted NASA budgets, but we, d we have received support from the president to increase the NASA budget. Um, and we have received, uh, and, and so that has happened on a budget request perspective. Now we need to make sure that Congress follows through and supports us, but I've had conversations with people on both sides of the aisle that have been supportive, so that's important. Um, but the, but the, the elements, as you saw in the video, you've gotta have a big rocket, that's the SLS. It's on the five yard line, we're about to punch it into the end zone. Um, then we've got the Orion crew capsule uh, with, with what's called the European service module. We have an international partnership on the service module. Um, and then, and then we, gotta, we gotta build that space station in orbit around the moon, we call it gateway. The reason that's important, two things, well, a lot of things, but it gives us sustainability. It's a reusable command module that we be in orbit around the moon permanently. It also has propulsion, solar electric propulsion, which gives it staying power, and it can deliver us to more parts of the moon than ever before. 1969 to 2009, 40 years, we thought the moon was bone dry. Then we find out hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the South Pole. We've got to use that. That's, that's how we sustain life. And by the way, that same water ice is all over Mars. So let's go do that. Um, the moon is the proving ground. Mars is the destination. The challenge with Mars is that the Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun once every 26 months. So when you go to Mars, you've got to be willing to stay. That's hard. Uh, the moon is, is, is always with the Earth. Wherever we are around the sun, the moon is with us. <laughs> And so we can use it as a proving ground. Um, and we've learned on Apollo 13, things can go wrong and you can make it home. Uh, that's why the moon is so valuable. Something like that happens on the way to Mars, you're done. You're done. Yeah. So uh, the moon is the proving ground, Mars is the destination. We gotta make that happen. So I have a question here. Um, to what degree do private space launch companies have to have NASA's permission? That's probably sort of a crude way to put it, but but you know, when we hear when we hear like SpaceX and Elon Musk talking about building a Mars rocket and all that kind of stuff, uh, what is the relationship between companies like that and their plans and NASA? Do they need NASA approval? Is the relationship even closer than that? I mean, how does it work? So this is a brand new area. This is we're mm. this is unique. Um, mm. So there's not a lot of uh, law and policy and regulation on these activities. 
But I will tell you, all of the commercial companies, all of them want NASA certification. And by the way, the ones that are closest are the, are the ones, no kidding, that NASA has invested in. So when we're investing, say, $4 billion into a commercial vehicle to launch astronauts to, the low, to low Earth orbit, I can tell you that they are going to get permission from yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. Because it's your money, and it's American astronauts. Um, and, and yes, we want them to go get customers that aren't us. But those customers aren't going to show up unless we have certified the rocket. I'm just telling you the mm. honest reality of the markets. Mm. When NASA puts its stamp of approval, people will buy it. When NASA doesn't, people don't. And that, that is why they're so interested. No, we don't. Look, if they want to start launching things into space, the, the regulatory environment for that goes through the FAA, the Office of Commercial Space Transportation. NASA is not a regulator of commercial space activity. All of that will be done through the FAA. Um, but, but all of those private companies um, do want NASA's certification that, that we're willing and able to use it because then they can go sell it. Okay. We had a question about what you were covering about how you, you know th the Space Force is, is a thing uh, and, and it's all, you know, the President has passion about that and passion about NASA and you said it's kind of separate slices of the pie. The gentleman wants to know what is the relationship between NASA and the Space Command going big? Great question. Um, so. When we think about Space Force, there's, there's two pieces of that. So he, you mentioned Space Command. So the Space Command is a combatant command. It's how you fight and win wars, and it's joint in nature. It includes all the military services. This goes back to a, a bill called Goldwater-Nichols, uh, 1990s, I believe, maybe 1980s. Um, but the Goldwater-Nichols bill created a separate um, way of fighting and winning wars from how you organize, train, and equip military forces. So the military services, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, they're the ones that organize, train, and equip the cadre of professionals that fight and win wars. Now the Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines then present forces to the geographic combatant commands. People are familiar with CENTCOM or YURCOM, Africa Command. They're familiar with Pacific Command. Those are the geo so, so we have organized, train, and equip, and then we have fight and win wars. Under Goldwater Nichols, the president can create a combatant command. That's what Space Command is, and he has done that, and rightly so. In fact, it's overdue. When it comes to creating a military service to organize, train, and equip warfighters, that military service should be the Space Force for the space cadre, and that requires a law passed by Congress in order to do that. Um, so uh, that being said, I just want to clarify Space Command from Space Force. But when we talk about NASA's role, um, we don't do national security and defense. We're, a, we're, a, we're a, 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 an exploration agency. We're a science agency. We, 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 we wear all of those elements of soft power, diplomacy, information, economics. Those are the elements where we play. We don't play necessarily in defense. Um, but I will tell you this, and this is so important. All right, I just figured out why this is important. <laughs> I just got your attention. <laughs> okay, so we think back, you and the first kind of foray into something that was Space Force related was the Strategic Defense Initiative. And I know right. there's a lot of young folks Star over here Wars. that might not remember Star Wars. Ronald Reagan announced that we're gonna, we're gonna create a missile defense shield in space. We need to have sensors and the ability to defend against intercontinental ballistic missiles. That requires a shield in space. And that, and everybody said, it's not technologically achievable. It's too expensive. It can never be done. And they called him crazy. And then they tried to belittle the entire program by calling it Star Wars. And of course, Ronald Reagan was like, yeah, it's Star Wars. Yeah, let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then he called it Star Wars. And that's, that's, yeah. it, what, became, what was a problem became a, a win. But here's what's interesting. We spent hardly anything on the Strategic Defense Initiative. It never really went anywhere. But you know who spent a lot trying to make sure that it, we, they were prepared against it? The Soviet Union. The Soviet Union. Right, it brought them down. It, it did. Now why, if you had half the politicians in America saying it can't be done and it's too expensive and mm -hmm. it's stupid, why did they believe it? I'll tell you why they believed it. Because a dozen years earlier, we had people walking on the surface of the moon. That's right. They believed we could do anything we set our minds to. It was built, as a matter of fact, on the credibility of Apollo. 
That's why NASA matters to national security. And today, when we talk about the Space Force, uh, or I should say U.S. Space Command, a lot of what it does is going to be secret. It'll be in the black, if you will. People won't know about it, and people won't see it, and I'm telling you, you don't want to know about it, and you don't want to see it. But I'll tell you what, people are going to see the stunning achievements of NASA, and that will be open and transparent for all the world to see. So it works hand in glove. People need to know that we have amazing capability and amazing technology, and they need to not know how we're using that to make sure that America will not be, at, will not be threatened. And, and that's a great place for us to end. I, I, okay. We could sit around and do this all afternoon. I got another but, hour. I don't but, know But else. not everybody else is in, the same, is in the same boat. So will you please all join me in thanking Jim Bridenstine for being with us. <laughs>